Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'd, I'd first like to thank the CTBUH for the opportunity to speak today. As Stephen stated earlier, I've been employed by Brookfield Multiplex for the last 20 years and have had the honour of living in Dubai for the last 15, where a huge amount of tall towers have been built. My career is focused on tall towers and how to build them more efficiently and fast. I'm definitely a better builder than I am a talker, but today I'll talk about some of the changes associated with the construction of tall towers that have occurred in the past 20 years. But first, the question, what defines a tall tower? Many would say a building over so many floors. Other would say a building over a certain height. I'm going to focus on the latter, as I personally believe that height has far greater challenges than the number of floors. So what is tall? If we take the Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest building, standing at 828 metres, is a building half the height of the Burj considered tall? The answer is most certainly yes. However, there are only 15 buildings in the world that are taller than 414 metres. So my talk would be definitely quite limited. So let's look at the last world's tallest building, the Taipei 101, 509 metres tall. Is a building half the height of Taipei 1 considered tall? I think this is a good benchmark to work from. 20 years ago, in 1993, there were only 46 buildings in the world taller than 250 metres. 36 of these were in the United States, six were in Asia, three in Australia and one in Europe. Today is a different story. There are 240. 54 in North America, but the strange thing, only 45 of these are in the United States. That's nine buildings in the last 20 years. 111 buildings are now in Asia, 60 in the Middle East, five in Australia, one in South America, and nine in Europe. What this clearly demonstrates is the majority of tall buildings in the past 20 years have been built in developing countries. Construction technology in these regions is often vastly different to those undertaken in developed countries, but there is a lot to learn from construction that has taken place. If we focus on Europe, our host continent today, there are nine towers that fit into my category of tall. That's a small number compared to other parts of the world. What is interesting though, all but two of these have been complete in the last eight years. So what we can see is the trend is changing. As land costs and population density increase, the only way is up. So if we look at the methods of construction, prior to 1993, tall towers were predominantly constructed from structural steel. There were two reasons for this. The first, the USA, where the majority of tall towers were constructed, was very industrial and steel was the preferred method. Secondly, concrete technology was poor. Concrete strengths of 50 MPA were achieved, but not normal. So to gain height, the vertical elements became too large. Today, the majority of tall towers are built from concrete. Concrete technology over the years has improved dramatically, meaning concrete columns and walls have reduced in size and can carry far greater compressive loads. In this photo alone, there are seven towers greater than 250 metres, all constructed from concrete some with concrete strengths greater than 100 MPA. It is a known fact that tall buildings are expensive. The higher you go, the higher the cost per square metre. So when a tall tower is conceived, all aspects must be considered. For tall towers, there are two main considerations, design and buildability. Both of these go hand in hand. As a company, we spend a huge amount of time with our consultants to ensure our overall design approach is in line with the way we want to build. To me, this is the secret to our success. In recent years, we've been engaged by clients both during concept and scheme design phases to ensure the proposed design can be built in an efficient way. The largest of these were the Chicago Spire, a 600 metre tower in Chicago, Nathani Heights, an 80 storey tower in Mumbai, and recently, Supernova, an 88-storey tower in Delhi. We were even requested by EMA to assist in the selection of the most buildable solution for the kilometre-tall tower in Jeddah. With our parent company being one of the world's largest property owners, our understanding of the end product is second to none. 
We understand that we are designing for tomorrow, not today. We understand the most important aspect of the project is the net lettable area, and an efficient building is fast and successful building. One of the biggest innovations in the past 20 years is BIM. 20 years ago, AutoCAD was relatively new. It was efficient compared to hand drawing, but was still painfully slow. Drawings were neat, easy to modify, but they still only produced two-dimensional images. Today, we no longer have draftsmen, we have BIM technicians. These skilled individuals create models of our buildings that allow us to understand each and every aspect of the building at a touch of a button. In the past three years, we've set up an in-house BIM department where we now have over 60 trained technicians and use BIM in some form or another on every project undertaken. As we build higher and higher, the design of MEP services, facades and lifts have to develop at the same rate. Consultants have had to completely change their approach to design and manufacturers have had to develop new products to ensure buildings can be fed with essential services, facades can withstand the greater wind speeds and lifts can travel fast enough to ferry the masses of people to their destination in an acceptable duration. Keeping up with these changes and integrating these into new, new buildings is essential. Recently, we've been involved in a building for one of our major clients in an old city. We had a very short period of time, so we focused on three items. Core configuration, the structural solution, and plant room efficiency. Successfully dealing with these issues had enormous benefits for the project. The results were astonishing. The, the overall design of the building stemmed from the design philosophy that had been used in the region for many years. Use as little concrete as possible and make everything else work. This is a common approach in developing countries. Pricing a BOQ does not take into account the complexity of the project, its location, or the constraints associated with the works. Our first step was to reconfigure the core. The design undertaken had addressed the code requirements, but it didn't look at how it was going to be built, its efficiency, or the end user. The result was a very efficient use of space, a very efficient core from a services perspective, and a core that could be built using system formwork, speeding up construction considerably. Secondly, we looked at the slab solution. My remit to the designers was post-tension flat slab. This would allow me to deal with the MEP far easier and would be much quicker to build. The results obtained allowed us to reduce the floor to floor height by 380 millimetres whilst maintaining the internal space constraints the client required. On this project where height was the limiting criteria, we were able to offer the client 10 additional floors of sellable area with a relatively low increase in construction cost. Our final task was to look at plant rooms. By reconfiguring the core, we dealt with a huge amount of the space issues. However, the rationale behind the distribution was old. Our in-house MEP team changed the entire concept and gained a full floor of sellable area. In just four weeks, we had gained the client 25,000 square metres of sellable space and it had reduced its construction program by six months just by simplifying the design. Our second consideration, buildability. My role in the company is to ensure our buildings are, far, are built fast and efficiently using the most up-to-date construction equipment, methodologies and solutions that are best suited to the country we're building in. As I'm involved in so many countries, I have to look at each and every building with an open mind. As a company, we always had the philosophy of fabricate off-site, integrate on-site. Whilst I still agree with this, on taller buildings, there are many other factors to consider. And I think David and I may disagree on a few issues from here on. It is fair to say that every, it is fair to say that every country in the world will still have different methods of construction. And there are many reasons for this. The cost of labour, the cost of materials, climatic conditions, and the skill set. To stand here and say that there's only one way to build would be naive. However, have I, however, as I've been fortunate enough to build towers in Australia, Malaysia, India, Middle East, London, and North America, I can categorically say that the construction of tall towers are governed by the same problems. These problems are simple. Wind, hook time, getting workers to the work face, and the skill set of labor. Wind, one of the biggest problems I encounter every day. 
As we build higher and higher, wind is going to affect our lives more and more. My desire, and what I'm continually working towards, is to minimise the need of the tower crane. While she will never get rid of them, and I love playing with them, the effects of wind at height should not be underestimated. On a number of our projects, we've lost up to 50% of time due to wind at heights above 200 metres. This is significant and cannot be ignored. To address this, we firstly look at formwork solutions. 20 years ago, the predominant way of doing cores was the slip form. Today, slip form is not commonly used around the world as it requires high levels of skill, perfect concrete designs, and can have massive problems if something goes wrong. In saying this, slip form is the method of choice here in the UK, and I must say they do it very well. Both slip form and jump form have their problems. However, however over the years, we've been working with bespoke jump form designers to design the perfect system. Today, I believe we're getting close. The benefits of jump form are simple. It provides an extremely safe work environment. There is no chance of an open edge. It is very simple to use. It is self-sufficient. We can climb with as little as 8 MPA concrete strength, and we can pour very large volumes of concrete in a short period of time. In our designs, we include as much vertical concrete within the system. If I can do it all, I am much happier. A great example of this is the Emirates Park Towers in Dubai. All vertical elements of this building were jumped. On to my latest concept. This is the jump form for the 370 metre tall address hotel in Dubai. It's an 840 ton jump form without the weight of 5,000 square metres of plywood. It takes all vertical elements up, up to and including the spire support walls. This system is 100 metres long. It's broken in two sections and will progress at four days per floor. Concrete placing booms are fixed to the upper frame. Other than dismantling and feeding reinforcement, the crane is not required for the operation of the jump. 20 years ago, formwork was essentially undertaken with steel frames, timber and plywood. This was very labour intensive and slow. Today, all of the major formworkers have designed their own form of handset system. These systems are light, easy to move and are very efficient. With the use of a self-climbing formwork hoist or even just passing the components to the floor above, there is no longer a need for a tower crane for the movement of horizontal formwork. Safety on site has improved dramatically over the past 20 years. The thought of an open edge is unheard of. The best form of edge protection is the safety screen. These have been around for many years, but improvements in recent years have the screens been climbed by hydraulics rather than tower cranes. So to build a tall structure, we can use a fully automated jump form that takes all the verticals within the system, use a handset formwork, horizontal formwork with self-climbing screens. We've now eliminated the need for the tower crane other than lifting reinforcement. And if anyone can help me with this, I'm yet to work out a solution. So on to the very thing I'm trying to eliminate, the tower crane. Whilst the last few minutes have been talking about not using tower cranes, they are still a very important and essential part of every project. In recent months, we've seen some major incidents with tower cranes. Here in London, a helicopter ran into the tower of our crane on St George Tower. In New York, during the hurricane, the jib of the crane was pushed back over itself. And in Sydney, a major fire on a machine deck. And I'm sure there are many more. All of these incidents had major impact on their respective projects and their surroundings. And I think anyone involved in tall towers will have a story which would send shivers down people's spines. It is fair to say that there are not many cranes capable of building our super tall towers. Between Favelle, Favco and Potain, they have built all of the 20 tallest buildings in the world. The complexity of the motors and the winches for these cranes are phenomenal and huge amount of R&D is ongoing in both these companies. The two major challenges I deal with on any tower is how to put the last piece of the spire up and how will I get the last crane down. It is fair to say I sometimes spend weeks dealing with these issues. This will only get harder as buildings get taller. Another one of our major challenges with tall buildings is the movement of people. One thing that is for sure, the taller the building, the more men required to build it, and the longer they will spend in hoists. 
In recent years, I've looked at hoisting strategy to improve efficiency. In most complete tall towers, there will be low rise, high rise, and sometimes sky rise lifts that move occupants around. It is easy to implement similar strateg strategies using construction hoists. The solution significantly improves the waiting time for workers and moves men around the building faster. On a number of projects, we have erected construction hoists from elevated platforms halfway up the building. By utilising the builder's lifts, we were able to remove the hoist from the lower portion of the building, close up the penetrations through the podium, and completely close the facades on the lower floors. This has major benefits in the completion of the building. An additional improvement that is becoming more and more popular is the common tower. Again, this is not new technology. However, the engineering behind it and the type of material used has significantly changed. The philosophy is to locate all your hoists into a confined area, allowing up to three twin high-speed hoists to feed from, the common from a common platform. In doing this, the affected area of the facade is minimised, allowing the building to be easily waterproofed and the maximum area to be finished. Over the past four years, we've been working closely with CAS out of London on creating the most cost-effective solution for common towers. What was derived was an aluminium structure with components that could be dealt with by hand with no need for the tower crane. Our St George Tower in, in London was the prototype for this system and has successfully reached 180 metres. Our address tower in Dubai uses the same technology for a different reason. Our, fa our facade steps in irregularly by 12 metres over 320 metres. 20 years ago, we could not have dreamt of dealing with this problem in a similar way. In closing, building high-rise towers is complicated and challenging. As managers and designers, we need to ensure we design buildings that work for our clients and are easy to build. With climate changes happening around the world, we need to go back to basics and ensure we provide a safe and efficient workplace for the talented people who build our dreams. By providing systems that are easy to use and are not reliant on tower cranes, we can ensure that we gain the most out of every day, no matter what height we are at. I'll just leave you with a few slides of some of our projects completed around the world. Thank you. <laughs>